All right. Woo. Good. Perfect. I got it. Perfect. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very excited. <laughs> very excited about this. We're just waiting for uh, our international journalist, Alice Smith, to join us. So welcome, everyone. Good afternoon to you all. <laughs> good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to you all. Just, um, hello. Magnus. Good afternoon, brother. Hello, Jamima. Hey, Adeline. How are you doing? Hello, Tracy. <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. Andre, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, 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 welcome. Hey, Jasmine. How is England? Good afternoon, Peter. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is going to be very extraordinary. <laughs> um, as you all know, for some of you that are, are following my work, I do a lot of social activism advocating for human rights for the people of Southern Cameroons. Um, so we're just waiting for our international journalist, Ellis Smith, to, uh, to join us. So, Mr. Smith, we're waiting for you. <laughs> Hello, uh, um, Jelani. Good afternoon, brother. So for those of you that are all right, we're just waiting for Mr. Smith to join us. For those of you that are, I do a lot of social activism work, advocating for human rights for the people of Southern Cameroons. And uh, so today I will be interviewing an international journalist to give us a greater perspective as to what went wrong. And why is the world not responding? what new leadership is needed and how can this situation be uh, be transformed so as we wait for mr smith good morning brother well good morning to you jelani um it's afternoon to most of the people back home so that's why <laughs> good afternoon mr church klaus Welcome. No worries, Klaus. Even if you don't, bro, no worries. You know, the video, I'll be out, upload the videos, the video and share it on uh, many other platforms. <laughs> wow, Michelle. Hello. We're just waiting for Mr. Smith, the international journalist, to join us. Good morning. How are you doing? We're just waiting for our friend, Mr. Ellis Smith to join us. So, Mr. Smith, the crowd is waiting for you. We're waiting for you. So while we wait, I just want to say hello to my friends that are joining us. How is everyone doing? Happy Easter to you all, my friends in Ontario, in Toronto, in Brampton. All my friends, happy Easter to all of you. I hope you all enjoy the, uh, the holiday. Hello everyone, we're just waiting for Mr. Smith. So, it's technology. He's somewhere in another continent, so <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Hello Yvette, uh, Yvonne, how are you doing? How is DC? We're just waiting for Mr. Smith. So 
guys just uh just be patient a little bit you know mr smith is in another continent so we're waiting for the connection here <laughs> he's ready he just texted me that he was ready so we just spoke about a minute ago so i hope everyone is doing great hope everyone is having a great easter some of you are busy cooking or maybe playing with your kids or just resting hello peter good afternoon bro this is going to be very interesting so uh it's a lot of information that uh <laughs> that will make people's eyes roll so all right we're just waiting for mr smith so just calm down guys no worries i'm here i'm here so what's going on with everyone what's everyone up to for the weekend how is your easter what do you plan for easter What do you guys plan? Just go ahead and type. Just say something nice. <laughs> what do you guys plan? What are you guys doing for the Easter? Yes. Sickard. <laughs> Good afternoon. Hello, Robert. For those of you that are my, uh, uh, this video it's for my uh, my work, for my uh, social activism as a human rights activist, advocating for human rights for the people of Southern Cameroons and human rights all over the world. So today I'm going to be interviewing uh, an international journalist by the name of Ellie Smith um, to give us a greater perspective, very objective from as to why what is happening in Southern Cameroons, it's happening, um, who failed them, what can be done, how, why is the world silent, and how can the world respond positively, and what can be done to, uh, to stop the genocide and the war that uh, the, uh, the dictator of uh, La Republic du Cameroon, Paul Bia, the war that he's declared, on this on the on the peaceful people of southern cameroons yeah. so it will be very interesting to hear what an international the perspective of an international journalist and his insight since he's covered these governments their ministers their way of thinking so we would like to uh to get his insight we're just waiting for mr smith so mr smith if you can hear me can you just uh, join us <laughs> I know that sometimes the internet connection in probably where you are is probably is not as reliable right now. So we're going to be a little bit patient here. Hello, Cecilia. Happy Easter to you. Happy Easter. We are still waiting for our famous uh, international journalist. All right, so just hold on, guys. Hold tight. You know we have. Uh, you know we. I was doing another live broadcast, and then we abruptly. I had to abruptly end that broadcast so that we can be able to host this one. So, <laughs> so just hold on tight, guys. How is everyone doing? Uh, Magnus, I hope that you know that Mr. Smith is a journalist. So um, just so you know, I'm not coming here for Mr. Smith to tell where he stands. Um, um, this is I'm going to interview Mr. Smith since he's worked within this government. He knows the inner workings of the government. He knows how they function. And uh, we just want to get, you know, empirical, objective perspectives. <laughs> Yes, that's true. CFA. <laughs> yeah, you know it's uh, it, it it's it keeps my uh, my water a little bit warm. You know the weather is still a little bit cold, so that's why I put it in that cup. It, it keeps it warm. Nyenti. <laughs> now, no, bro. 
Salut. Hello everyone. Hello everyone. Hello my people in Rotterdam. Good heart it. Good midak. Adeline. Hat good. How is uh, Rotterdam? How is beautiful Netherlands? Who had it, man? Mirabel, good, good, good morning to you. Good morning to those in North America and good afternoon to those in Southern Cameroons on Ground Zero. Good afternoon to you all. We're just waiting for uh, our great friend, Mr. Smith. So, just hold on a second here. Just waiting for Mr. Smith. Let's check this camera. Let's check this phone. Okay. Cancel. Open. Let's get in touch. I'm using another phone. I'm making a call. Hang on, guys. This is going to be fun. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Smith. Are you connecting? Okay. I'm st we are online waiting for you. Okay. I said we are I'm already online. We are online waiting for you. Dr. Nicolas Santo, good afternoon. The press secretary of the Federal Republic of Amazonia. Good afternoon, sir, and thank you for joining us. Very deeply honored. So just hang on tight. Hello, John. How are you doing? Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, friends. <laughs> Hello. Thank you, sir. We appreciate it. We're just waiting for Mr. Smith, and uh, this is going to be very interesting. <laughs> it's good our people know why what is happening, it's happening, and who's pushing the buttons. Hey, when Mulan, our spiritual great master, good afternoon to you, sir. So for those of you that usually do not usually uh, um, see me often to, uh, to do my social activism work here, it's because I have a special page for all my social activism work regarding my uh, advocacy for human rights. For the people of Southern Cameroons. So, <laughs> Rina Lee, how are you doing? It's good to have you here. Thank you very much. Namaste, Wayne. Thank you very much. We appreciate the incredible work you are doing out there, Wayne. We really appreciate you. It's extraordinary what you've been doing out there. Hello, Lauren. Good to have you here. So I know that for most of you, you are not used to seeing me doing advocacy work. You know, I'm a, I do a lot of work as a human rights activist, advocating for human rights for people all across the globe. Right now, my focus is on the people of Southern Cameroons, these remarkable people that their independence was stolen from them since 1961, and they've been occupied by another African nation and there's a dictator down there that has now recently just declared war upon the people, burning villages, 
In the last three weeks, four grandmothers have been burned alive, where entire villages have been burned down by the military, and uh, a few grandmothers that couldn't escape have been burned alive. Uh, yesterday, in another village, the military went there, they killed 21 people, including a woman who has a, a three-month-old baby. The baby was killed, the mother was killed. So that's why uh, I'm speaking out, I'm getting the world to know what's happening in Southern Cameroon, and uh, to protect these people, to protect these children. So we are just, today we're focusing on getting a perspective from an international journalist to give us a deeper understanding of what's really happening on the ground. What are the dynamics? What are the forces that are responsible for these things? And what are going to be some of the, inter the, con the international consequences to these people that are perpetrating these types of genocide, these, type, these types of crime? What will happen to the dictator himself? What will happen to the, the people around him that are pushing for this because they're making a lot of money through these uh, uh, military operations? What will happen to, to all the atrocities that's, that are being committed? So um, we're just waiting for Mr. Smith. Let me place one more call. I know I've been keeping you all waiting. Piroska, how are you doing? <laughs> Good to see you. I'm placing one more call. Mr. Smith, can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, Mr. Smith, we're waiting for you. Can you connect? Yes, uh, no, on my personal profile, Lucas Asu, we are already live. <laughs> All right, we're waiting. <laughs> Bye. All right. Yeah, we are. Yes. <laughs> All right. Jelani, I've been seeing the great work you've been doing, my friend. It's extraordinary. Um, You've launched your new uh, coaching, uh, uh, business coaching. I'm very proud of you, my brother. I'm very proud. Okay. Good afternoon to you, Mr. Smith. Good afternoon, Mr. Smith. Here yeah, we are. Good afternoon, Mr. Smith. Good afternoon. Well, we are very, very delighted. We are very, very delighted to have you here um, on this uh, live broadcast. Same. I'm also very delighted. All right. To all our viewers that are watching, I would like to introduce you uh, to those of you, my Canadian family and friends. Uh, this is something that is going to be very new for most of you because you, you usually do not see me in this type of setting because you always see me on my professional leadership and coaching mm -hmm. or speaking certain. So now you're going to see me in another dynamic. I'm also a social activist, a human rights activist advocating for human rights for the people of Southern Cameroon. Mm -hmm. And so today we are very uh, pleased mm -hmm. to have the honor to have uh, an international journalist to give us his perspectives about the dynamics what's really happening in southern cameroon so mr smith can you uh just uh, the viewers can you just go ahead and just share and invite your friends because this is so important we need to get lots of people to listen to this <laughs> just go ahead and share and invite okay. your friends thank you it's a pleasure of being here 
All right, so Mr. Smith, can you give us a little background about yourself? Because I know that you, I know you, are, you, you, work, you work for all kinds of media houses. Uh, right now, I think you are working with uh, Bloomberg. Yeah, yes, yes. I work with Bloomberg, uh, yeah, uh, on a freelance basis. Yes, I'm with, Ble with, with Bloomberg. But you've also worked, uh, I know that you had a, a big portfolio. You did some great work in the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. No, the Republic of Congo, you know, <laughs> the Republic of Congo and the DRC have the problem that uh, Lebanon and Syria used to have. People like to talk a lot about Lebanon, about Syria and try to ignore Lebanon. Well, I was in uh, the Republic of Congo for close to four years. Okay. I was directing a TV station there. Okay. Uh, concomitantly, we had a media group, a, 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 a media group that we had two news, a, a daily, two TV stations, uh, two radio stations, and a printing press. So you were, very, you, you were very busy as a director of all of those programs. Yes. Life is like that. There are ups and downs. All right. So we are very delighted to have you and to get your insight, to get your experience, because you've been on the ground. Uh, you've been on the ground. You've covered a lot of these, uh, a lot of the events that are happening on the ground. Can you give us just a genesis, a synopsis of what what is happening in Southern Cameroon. Well, what is happening in Cameroon in general and Southern Cameroon in particular is that uh, it, it was a kind of corporatist movement that began, I think, two years ago, whereby teachers and lawyers wanted the implementation of the by jural and the, the by educational system of the country which has not been implemented. I think that is the basics of what happened today. Had it been the government had wanted to respect the bicultural heritage of this country, we would not be where we are today. And it has become clear that the idea originally was that they wanted to francophonize the Anglophone part of Cameroon. And it's something that doesn't date today. I am not the one, I'm not the author of this, there is a book written, the title of that book is uh, Dossier Noir sur le Cameroon. Mm -hmm. The author of that book is uh, mm -hmm. Pierre Ella. He was a police commissioner here in Cameroon, and he wrote that book saying that, you know, there is this story, this fairy tale that bilingualism was the, uh, like the cradle of the unity of Cameroon, that when they opened the first bilingual school somewhere in the southwest, it was to perpetuate the unity. No, it's a lie. Pierre Ella said the idea was to make Anglophones become Francophones. Stay there. Right. Right. Just, stay, just stay there, Mr. Smith. To our Canadian viewers, because we have a, a Canadian audience that is watching mm -hmm. this. We want them to understand that Cameroon, it's one of, it's a bilingual country. Uh, Cameroon, yes. there, were, there were two Cameroonian mm -hmm. countries that came together. There is the Southern Cameroons, and then there's the French Cameroon. This country came together when the United Nations decided to do something called a plebiscite, a referendum for this country. To came, they came together to form what they call the Federal Republic of Cameroon. And a certain, and to my understanding, there was a certain agreement that was supposed to be, uh, uh, to be reached as the foundation for what the future of that nation will be respecting the Anglophones, which is the English-speaking people of Southern Cameroon, the minorities, and the Francophones, which are the majority part of Cameroon, for these two entities to merge. There was a certain agreement. Tell us about that agreement so that our Canadian audience can have an understanding of why what is happening is happening. About the agreement uh the agreement was uh the respect of both heritages the heritage of french-speaking cameroon and that of english-speaking cameroon but it was on off on a false start mm -hmm. because there's one book again because it's good that in this thing we should not just be talking like that we should have proofs of what we are saying that's right the last governor the last governor of east cameroon his name is pierre mesmer he was also the governor of Algeria. He wrote a book entitled in French, Les Blancs Sans Vent. He said 
when the unification was signed mm -hmm. in Fumban, officially uh, Cameroon became a, an of, officially a French and English speaking country with French being the official language. There's a nuance there. Yes. And if you look again in the Federal Constitution of 1961, they said that constitution is translated into French and in English, but the French version remains authentic. So there was a problem from the onset. And in the discharge of the people of East Cameroon, because we should not always be accusing them, is that Aijo is a man who was imposed on East Cameroon. He did not win any elections. He fought against the UPC people and the French imposed him. And when he paid a visit to De Gaulle, De Gaulle told him, you are going to have two countries. And I'm not the one who says that you read the book again of Pierre Ella, Dossier Noir sur le Cameroon. And De, De Gaulle advised him that you must transform your people into mm -hmm. French-speaking people. That's the reason why there's always this idea behind uh, in the unity between French and East Cameroon, the losers have been the Anglophones. And the only thing the uh, colonially imposed administrators of French Cameroon did not know was that uh, the Anglophones were to resist the last two things they have, their legal system and their educational system. So it's something they never knew. People will stand and fight for it till they die. Okay, so is that so? Is that what led to the crisis that started on September uh, in October two thousand and sixteen? Exactly, that is what really sparked it. But there is another thing, you know. Sometimes when you have a small dream, something burning somewhere, you need a spark, or when you have dry leaves, you just need a lightning for it to catch fire. Yes. What happened was that. Uh, there was this mm -hmm. translation of Owada, uh, Owada, the book of, I think, something on Owada, which was just only in French. And then lawyers said they should translate it into English as well, because we don't understand why, if we are a bilingual country, why should we always take everything in French? But that is what began the whole, story, uh, the whole problem. But we also, as Anglophones, our leaders, we have made also a lot of mistakes because we have been almost always subservient, almost acting like the wife or the husband who is being maltreated but wants to continue to keep the marriage because of the children. Yeah. We're not being outspoken. Okay. So that's the reason. And now, uh, after October, the lawyers and the teachers came up front, but the government also turned some three members of the government, I will not give their names because it's not proper, they had this tendency of being very arrogant and felt that it is not going to go anywhere. Uh, so stay, uh, fall... stop. Let, let's stay there. So let's, the, our, because we have a Canadian, uh, we have a North American viewership. We want to make sure yes, that sir. they also understand what's happening because they will be the people to take this story and, and mm -hmm. take it out to the streets and take it out to their family and tell the people of the world that there is something brewing in Southern Cameroons. People are yes. dying, people are killing. So we want them to understand the genesis of the problem so that when they are talking, when they are telling the story, they can be very objective. So the lawyers and the teachers of the English-speaking section of Cameroon, they felt that their educational system, their legal system was being francophonized. Yes, sir. Is that true? Yes, sir. That was exactly what was happening. And so... I and can so, give you... And so they, they took to the streets to just ask yes. the government to say, okay, it's just like in Canada. We have the French section of, Ca of Canada and we have the English section. A province like the province of Quebec, they have an exclusively French system. But even though Canada is a bilingual nation, but most of the things in Quebec, they are in French. Yes, sir. And so, yes, sir. And so the, English, the English lawyers and teachers took to the streets what do they want the government to rectify? They wanted to correct a historic wrong, whereby you send lawyers, teachers in our regions who can barely speak English. Okay, stay there, with, don't you. Even... Just stay there with us. So basically, the Cameroonian government, which is French dominant, was taking French trained teachers, 
French trained lawyers, French trained judges and magistrates, sending them to the English speaking region to administer. So how you go to, you go to the court, you speak English, but your judge who's presiding over your case, it's a French judge. Is that correct? Absolutely correct. And, and the worst and, part and, of it. Is and children will go to school. Children of English speaking background will go to school, but their teacher wants to teach them in French. Is that correct? Brilliant. I have an example because sometimes people just run. I have my cousin who is French speaking. He was sent to Mount and he told me, Eli, I don't even know how to speak Pidgin, the lingua franca of the place. Talk less of English. So I don't see why they are sending me over there. And when the Anglophone teacher started complaining, and this is now the wool that they always put on the face of people, that, well, it's a bilingual country. You are free to speak either French or speak English, which is a kind of subtle way to transform you into what they are. And it's never the other way around. Okay. And they, the lawyers were just resisting. They wanted that. It's not as if the lawyers were refusing people of French-speaking expression to come. They had two problems. You can be of French-speaking expression, but if you understand the Anglophone common law, and if you can speak English, there is no problem. You can be a French-speaking teacher, but if you can speak English, there is no problem. And that is it. So the government was not willing. And there's another problem again. It's a matter of merit. Okay. At the University of Boya, we but know we, that uh, the uh, English... Hold it, oh, just hold on. Before we go too far, because we want our people to really understand. Yes. You sir. have a system where the government will take people that do not speak English and send them to the English section of the country to go there and teach. And then the government will take judges that do not speak English and do not understand the English system of law called the common law to go and administer a different system of law, different interpretation. So the lawyers and the teachers of the Anglophones, of the English pe speaking people in Southern Cameroon, they felt that their educational, their legal system was being taken away from them and replaced it with a system they do not understand. And as a result, they are going to become victims of that system. Is that correct? Yes, that's it. And their children will not have their children will not have a proper education because if a teacher speaks French, the child speaks English, who is going to teach who? That's a problem. And, and so what was the government response when the teachers and the lawyers took to the street to ask the government to correct these errors? What did what was the, the Cameroon government response? It was sheer brutality. They had to beat up the lawyers in Boya, in Victoria, and uh, they had to beat them up, and in Bamenda, they did not listen to them. No, they were beaten up. Can you be a little bit more detailed to our Canadian audience? We have a lot of Canadian audience. Tell them what brutality means. Let them understand. Brutality means that in the constitution of this country, you have the rights to demonstrate or voice your anger. These lawyers went down the streets to demonstrate and begging the government for, to respect the constitution of this country. But what the government instead did was go out and beat them up, arrest some of them. Which is what you, meant, what, limited... what you mean to say is that the government sends its special police, the gendarmes and the military, yes, sir. to beat the teachers, exactly. beat the lawyers? Sure, they were beaten up. Uh, there, there's a case of a lawyer, uh, I've forgotten his name, who was whose uh, uh, gown was uh, torn out, uh, taken. Anyway, most of them, they were seized. And it was later on, I, the, the, the governor sent out a communique that they can come and re retrieve their, 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 their rock. So the government did not respond in the right way. On the contrary, the government was very brutal with them. You know, sometimes, and most often, the narratives of this story is that of the government that people are hearing a lot. People haven't, people, the real actors on the ground who took part in it, like uh, Dr. Uh, Fontaine or Dr. Harmony Bobga, Agobala, people have not heard their own part of the story. Because if you hear what the government says, the government says 
there was an ever rising demands of anglophone lawyers and teachers which was which is or was a pure lie okay. you need to ask Fontaine you need to ask Bob Gahamoni the okay, thing is that so when the gov when the government when the government responded with military brutality police brutality what happened after that what happened after that was that to cut a long story short anyway there was a, a series of negotiation began and it was certain when you are going for a negotiation you don't set an agenda you bring yours i bring mine you don't dictate but it was clear that the government never wanted to solve the problem because some people within the government some minister in, some ministers in particular felt that behind the anglophone strike was a disguised plan to scuttle the ambition of Paul Via to present himself for another mandate. Whereas that had nothing. It's just simply because they were just afraid for nothing. And later on, they decided to arrest. If this crisis has become what it has become today, yes. it's simply because the government decided to arrest the moderate voices like Bob Gahamoni, uh, Agbobala, Fontem, and they left a boulevard for the extremists to take over. Okay. And when they took over. Yes, that's fine. Um, in your opinion, we know that the president of La Republic of Cameroon has been in power for 36 years now. Uh, is it 36 now? 36, yes. Who gave him this advice? Who, who was giving him this advice? <laughs> All right. I have an authoritative source. There are three... You know, in the government of Paul Bia, you have five individuals who are virtually running the show. Who are they? Um, I can give you the names, but now I'll not give you the person who said he should do that. Let's, but I can give you the name. Let's protect his identity. Exactly. In my humble, in my investigation, those whom I suspect, I'll put it on suspect, are really running the show. You have the former director of cabinet. You have the secretary general of the presidency of the republic. You have the Minister of Justice. Who's, what's the, you minister, have, what's, what, who's the Minister of Justice? The Minister of Justice, Laurent Esso. Okay. You, you have the Minister of Higher Education, who claims to be the ideologue of the regime. That's uh, Fem Dongo? Fem Dongo. You have uh, Ferdinand Gongo, who is the Secretary General of the Presidency of the Republic. You have the former Director of Cabinet, Mr. Belingai Butu. Those five individuals. What about uh, what, people? What about the minister of uh, the minister of territorial the former yeah. minister of territorial administration? Yeah, the former minister of territorial administration, but he's a good guy. Okay. Contrary to what people think, he is a good person. He is willing to listen. But there are some other two some individuals in the group who do not want to listen, and who and out of them, uh, you don't have uh, uh, Fame Dongo is not among the extremists. He is a kind of political person who, who follows the side of the wind. If it blows in his favor, he goes there. He's really a pure politician. After eliminating those three, you have two who are the ones, honestly, that if this regime has decided to tilt in a violent manner, they are responsible for that. Because some of them thought if the uh, uh, situation was solved, they might lose their positions. Some of them are nursing ambitions to succeed the president of the republic and All right. the Anglo here is this guys this is the cross the, this is the meat what you call the meat of this talk the people yes, the people behind the forces behind the violence the the forces behind the repression the forces behind the killing the forces behind the genocide here it is tell them yeah, so those people are the ones who really uh, misguided because Paul Bia is an old man and like any other dictator, he will pretend as though he doesn't want mm -hmm. to hang around mm -hmm. power. But that is the ultimate ambition. He wants it. And any person who tells him that, oh, sir, look, that gentleman who is talking like that, he's just talking, but behind what he's saying, he wants you to leave power and he doesn't want to leave power yes Bia doesn't want to leave power simply because i want i have one book that i will be repeating time and over again because it's written by a police commissioner who has worked with them 
And the title, you can buy it on Amazon. It's called Dossier Noir sur le Cameroun. And his name is uh, Pierre. He says one thing again. Paul Bia will not leave power. He will die in power for just one single reason. What is that reason? The reason is that in 1984, after the failed coup attempt, they really massacred a lot of people from the greater north of the country. Okay. And they are afraid of a reprisal. That is simple. He will not leave power. So anybody who tells him that, please, uh, Mr. Ailey wants you to leave power, you are his enemy. So that is it. So if today we are going toward genocide, we, you know it's a very powerful term to use genocide, but it, ha it has all the trappings. When you go into a village, you single out people from a region, you cut off internet, you burn their houses, you kill them, you rape them. It has all the trappings of genocide. But those who are behind it, you have two individuals who are really scuttled everything who, and they who are, are responsible. Who are, who, are, who are these people that are the forces behind the forces? The forces behind the forces are that I gave you at least five people. Then I'm seeing that those who are participating in the program, some people already know their names. You see, they are giving two names, but I don't want to give the names because, you know, that's why I want, whenever I'm saying things, I like to give proofs, That's true. books That's true. or authors, because it's important. I don't want to be cited for libel. Okay. We are living in a country where, yeah. But those two, some individuals are responsible for all what is happening today in our country. And it is a shame that because of them, and you understand, Alex de Tocqueville said sometimes the most difficult part in or in any government is when the government appears to want to open up because opening up might be interpreted as sign of weakness so for, and then for, those for, for, my, for my understanding because i had a, a great conversation with you a very lengthy conversation with you uh, yesterday which i'm re i'm very yes. grateful for your time you, you, yes, you said during when the lawyers and teachers were protesting and there was a, the government called them for some kind of a negotiation Bia wanted to compromise. Sure, yes. What was the, com wanted. What was the compromise Bia wanted to make? The compromise was ready because he has presided over a commission in 1978 or 79. Okay. Because these problems did not be begin today. Yes. From day one of the unification, people discovered there was a problem. And they, 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 anyway, they tried to manage things along. He wanted to compromise to go back to a federal system. Okay. Did he, yeah, wanted, because, did he wanted to compromise to go back to the two-state federation? No, he was ready to go back for a two-state federation. Who, because he too... Yeah. Who dissuaded because, him? <laughs> good. Well, from what I understand, the, uh, well, what somebody told me, uh, a, a, a diplomat, was that Bias asked some foreign diplomats for help. And they told Bia that the only way you can salvage the future of your country because you will not want to preside over the demise of your country, the disintegration, is to return back to the old format, the two-state federal system. Okay. But then there's a minister who said, no, we can't go back to a federal system because contrary to the placards that the lawyers were showing that a return to federation, the lawyers never wanted don't want federal system, but the problem of the lawyers and teachers was that they wanted to scuttle the presidential ambition of the president. And the president felt that, okay, these guys are pretending that they want to return to the federal system, whereas in reality, they don't want us or they don't want me to run again. And that was when he decided to change his disposition. And then the other thing is, the uh, military part of it. You know, this war is going on because... We haven't let it go. We haven't a little bit of an internet uh, interruption from where yes. Mr. Smith is. Yes. yes. Most, most ministers had signed contract for the supply of weapons. 
So there was no way uh, they could turn back once they This is getting interesting, guys. We know there's a little bit of an internet connection day, to where Mr. Smith during the is, negotiation. but I'm sure they are. Uh... So you're, you're talking about the fact that some ministers had signed some contracts to supply the nation with weapons. We didn't get that part because it, your, your screen was frozen. Yes. And I was saying that this another dimension of this crisis is about military con uh, uh, the supply of weapons. Uh, some ministers saw it as an opportunity to line their pockets and they signed contract yes. for the supply of weapons to the police, the gendarmerie, and even the army. And there was no way you could justify the purchase of new weapons if there wasn't anything going on. But now they never knew that things were going to turn the way it, was go it has turned right now. They made those mistakes. All right. So, so for, for, if, for those of you that, for, for those of you that are watching you listening right now this is why it's important for us to have this conversation with people that are on the ground with people that have access to where decisions are being made whether for the good or for the bad and who's actually making those decisions that's why i love this stuff i i don't believe in wishful thinking because i believe that when we have this kind of objective conversations when we can know what's happening, who's influencing what, then we know what policies and what new strategies that can be implemented, either to contain, to confront, or to, uh, uh, or to influence the situation in, in any way we can do. So we are, I'm so deeply grateful for your insights. Mm -hmm. Our people are getting great knowledge from this. They're understanding the dynamics of what's really happening because most people... They are just responding emotionally to the events. Yes, sir. So now, when the government decided that, okay, the military option will be the best way, according to the, the unfortunate mm -hmm. uh, bad advice they gave Mr. Bia by, through, by deceiving him that the military way will be the best option, what was their thinking? What was their calculation about the people of Southern Cameroon? What do they want to do militarily? Military, militarily, what they wanted to do was what they had done in, in Douala in 2002 or 2003. You can ask there uh, one lawyer here called Jean de, Jean de Dieu Momo. When almost at least 1,000 people were killed here. When, under was that? The, when was that? Between 2001 and 2002, there was a special operation taken, uh, organized in Douala to fight against the high level of crime in the city. And they, they, then they appointed a certain general called Mpai, who killed a lot of people. According to Jean de Dieu Momo, he's alive, because this thing, we have to have proof, he's alive. He, I interviewed him when I was working at Canal Do. He told me at least 1,000 people were killed in Douala. So the people that were arrested for either burglary, for stealing, they would take them and just go, and they take them somewhere and just kill them. Yeah, there was even a case where a neighbor went to the police and reported to another neighbor that the children had stolen a gas cylinder. Nine children, nine people have disappeared until date. There was a man who was on the bed with his wife, newly wedded. They took him from the bed and he was killed. We don't know where he is as we speak. And now let me continue. And then in 2008, during the um uh there was during the strikes on hunger something hunger strike hunger there was a demonstration in Douala because of hunger because of the, price, the, the food price food, the food prices were very the, high brilliant a lot of people were killed and when that thing when they decided to use brutal method on the on, on uh, here the strikes the momentum was broken. Yes, it was called commandement opérationnel. Okay. That was when they killed a lot of people. And they felt that it was like a dry run. The example was used in Douala okay. and all over. And it broke the momentum of the demonstration against the government. Mm -hmm. So they felt that, all right, we are going to use violent and brutal military tactics repression on anglophone cameroon okay and it's going to break everything 
Which means, so which, mean, why... which means, if we intimidate them enough, we beat them enough, we kill some people, the rest will become frightened, they will become quiet, and they will get off the streets. Yes, sir. That was what they wanted to do. Oh, that was what they, decide, they decided to do. And they tried it on the 22nd. And then the big one happened on the, on the 1st of first October. Of October. Okay. It was really a massacre. Now I am not going to, I'm not, I'm not exposing anybody. That's fine. Go to the Boya General Hospital and ask. By 6 o'clock on the 1st of October, at least 40 people were brought, killed, and the military were searching their pockets because these guys were demonstrating on the 1st of October were very intelligent because they knew the government would tag them as being foreigners. They all had ID cards in their jeans trousers. They had a peace plant and the Amazonian national flag. You can have the Ambazonian national flag and you have your ID card, which means that you are still Cameroonian, but you are demonstrating mm -hmm. for something. So what they were doing was that they were now coming, they brought the guys, searched their pockets, took away their ID cards. The idea was to say, but which has not been done, maybe it will be done one day, Please. to claim that those people were not Cameroonians, they were foreigners who came to demonstrate. So it's, basi it's, ba now... it's, basic it's basically the Anglophones have hired foreign mercenaries. Exactly. But they, were, they are now shocked because, even myself, to be, to be, called, to, to, to be sincere, uh, that they are now shocked because the demonstration are going on and has been going on for more than almost two years, and I think it's going to be more. So stay there with us. Has Mr. Bia's plan worked? It has failed. Okay. What do you think is their option? Well, it is a government in power. They still have international support. I think they still have other options, but I don't know what options mm -hmm. they will now have. Okay. What, why, do, what, why would all the atrocities, would the genocide, would a war, a crumbling economy. So here is a man declared war against the, 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 the Southern Cameroons that generates 65% of the national GDP. War has been declared upon that uh, uh, region of the nation. Uh, it's causing a lot of economic hardship. It's causing a lot of international pressure. Businesses in internationally do not want to invest in Cameroon because it's a great risk. Why would a rational government, which we know they are not rational, why would they continue to follow a policy? Economically, it's very destructive. It's very costly. It's, it's almost bankrupting the nation. Socially, it's very destructive. It's creating a lot of displacement. There are now, according to estimates, about 100,000 Southern Cameroonians that have become refugees in Nigeria. It's causing a lot of... Uh, uh, instability in the region. Why would a government continue with a policy that has such catastrophic consequences and the international community, as you, as you just said, they still have support. Can you tell us why this is happening? Perhaps I will start by the international community. The okay. problem of the international community mm -hmm. is that they have a full hand in Africa currently. They have a full hand. You what have you, the what case you, what, Tell us, break it down for us. What do you mean the international community has a full hand? Let our people I understand. want to, <laughs> yeah, from, to, in order for Puerto, it's just that there are a lot of crises around. Okay. A lot of crises. Uh, you have in Asia, like the Burmese crisis. In Africa, you have the Democratic Republic of the Congo. You have Central Africa Republic. You have Sudan, you have South Sudan. And what we almost always forget, we have Nigeria. Nigeria is really a major problem for the international community. Is that, is that, now, is that, because, is that because of uh, the Boko Haram? There is Boko Haram. And you also have what people don't want to talk about a lot, these Fulani herders. Yes. And then you have the nationalist movement in the greater south of the country, in the Niger Delta, 
in the East, like the, Bia the reactualization of the Biafran uh, nationalism. And in contrary to what people may think, even in Western Nigeria, you have this Odudua People's Congress that are also uh, perhaps in a very low key manner agitating for the Odudua Republic. That is it. And the other part is- So is that, so is that why nations like the United States, nations like the United States, like the, is that why the UN, is that why the US, is that why the EU, uh, is that why Saudi Cameroon is not as important to them as this other because they are, you said their hands are full or it's just a smaller crisis? No, there's never a small crisis. All crises are crises. The other, the other problem is simply that uh, the Southern Cameroonians need to retool. They don't know how to market their problems. Yeah, if we, you don't we, know how to... Yes, we, we will get there. But just tell us, is that what we, we want to find out why is it that the U.S. is not responding? As you said, their hands are full. And you said the Southern Cameroonians do not know how to um, sell their, pro their case. They don't know how to sensationalize international life. Can you help? Because people from the interim government are here watching. Can you tell them? Can you talk to our people? Yeah, mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. way, first of all, is to put your house in order. And what do you mean by putting is, your house in order? Putting your house in order is that I am mindful of the fact that when people are fighting for their freedom, you cannot have one main speaker. Okay. The, you can look at the case in South Sudan. People sometimes talk about Rick Marshall. Rick Marshall has always been against the SPLA, but sometimes they decided to put their acts together. In the, if you look at the case in, in Eritrea, even though Isha Afewerki had a dominant voice, you had some people who were on the margins. But the problem in, in, in southern Cameroons is that we should be able to have a preponderant voice. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean that we have to mm -hmm. silence others who have their own uh, opinions. One. Two. We have to talk about the humanitarian crisis. We should be able to make an account of all what has happened, written, and then sometimes pictured, and then be able to submit it somewhere. When we almost always come to talk only on historical facts, well, sadly, we are not the only people who have that problem. You know, there's a, there, there, there is an, another, another country in the world that is facing the same injustice as the Kurds. Since the Lausanne Treaty of 1923, the Kurds were divided into four countries. But why is it that people listen to their cases and not ours? So we need to put our acts together. That is it. We should be able to be... So if, to there, is, make if, there, very if, good... if there is one advice you can give the interim government of the people of Southern Cameroon, the most important advice concerning... Uh, uh, as you and I spoke yesterday, I, I like to use the word reframe, or I mean framing. How you, f you frame something determines how people were going to perceive it. So yes, sir. is that where they are, we are making a mistake? Is it because of the, la the proper framing of the problem? I, I, I think it's the pro proper framing of the problem. Uh, if you are not able, if you are always talking about history, you need to be able to make people know what is happening to your people. Okay. Which means that you should be able to put your resources in public relations. Okay. You can write a lot of books, but people need to know, for example, the case of Kwakwa, where you had three women who were burnt alive. But we have the star case because it happens. They can do, we can be everywhere, but you are the one people look at. That we talk most often about Mama Api. Yeah. But there were other two women who were burnt alive there, that day in Kwakwa. Many people don't know about that. And then secondly, uh, the other aspect is to be able to take down the records of everything we have done uh, that has happened from the 13 divisions of the Northwest and Southern uh, uh, regions of Southern Cameroons and be able to pass it around, to pass it out to people, tell people that our case is a case of genocide because this is what is happening, this is what is happening. And then at least we should have a preponderant, a big dominant organization that speaks for us. If you have 
everybody trying to have his own church or mosque preaching there and everybody wants to be a leader it to the international community people are afraid that these people are quite disorganized what will happen if today they have their own state that's right and and that is what killed southern cameroon in 1961 because foncha he did a lot of secret to in delhi because he had his problem with in delhi and then people even the people in east that's why people in east cameroon wanted to kill foncha because they felt that foncha mindful of everything was happening he went ahead with the unification so we should not repeat the same mistake we did in 1961 so, to so, so so if there are two takeaways here in just on this segment if there are two takeaways number one the proper framing of the problem as a human right as a as an act of genocide as an act of um let me call let me, yeah let's just call it genocide as an as a human rights situation a gross atrocity situation a human rights situation mm. instead of a historical situation it's a human right um violation right yes sir it, it is. is yes okay and then number two, the interim government should focus on getting its own act with its people together sure right sure okay. yes sir so let's go to the international media you are a journalist the media loves war zones they love the hot spots why has southern cameroon a hot spot in central africa right now why is it not on cnn why is it not on bbc why but i can assure you that very soon it's going to be on the bbc i'll not tell you when but okay. it is going to be okay it is going to be because uh, gradually but effectively even though the government is trying to place a kind of ban for people reporting but social media is doing a formidable job great people on social media are trying to make people know what is going around okay and people are trying now to listen to it but if the international community sometimes don't want to focus on is that our region sometimes we are proud but we are not that strategic people don't give us any consideration but we now need to know how to market our product so help the product us. help us there's a lot of activists online right now how should this activists focus their work as they continually do it on facebook talking to themselves or maybe the game is on twitter where they can reach the media with facts and exactly precision of the events where is the game the game now is we know social media works a lot it is good they can be talking on social media is good but they can they need also to form a network okay you should have a network of people on the ground whenever there is any story he will send it to you or she will send it to you and then you will now now have to ventilate it around um i know sometimes people are in a sense whereby people are egocentric people want to centralize things around them but you can have a network of 13 people in the 13 uh, uh, regions or sub uh, divisions of the northwest and southwest and from then whenever there is any incident that's why sometimes when i tweet i say if you see something report so when you say it you will tweet it or you put it on facebook and you don't know who watches it or who reads it so grad and that's the reason why major media out, uh, outlets or like the bbc people are now trying to say okay what is going on in that part of the world and to be sincere bbc has done one or two things on it but it is not as we would have we would have wanted it to be done so help us help us let's do it better we we want to learn from veterans <laughs> Yeah. how do how do our activists on social media how do they how should they report these stories how do they use hashtags what how, what is how do you get the international news outlets or international organizations like let's say amnesty international or the united nations human rights commission how do we write a story on facebook let's say i write a story you write a story and then that story reaches them immediately how do we do that or sometimes we can use the hashtags okay. but the the key is be accurate say the truth okay because i have discovered i might sometimes make mistakes but if i make a mistake on this new story i come and i apologize okay 
the reason why sometimes people don't believe what is going on is because there are a lot of lies uh, which, going is, which, on. Is, which is what which is what we call you take a true story and then you turn it into propaganda into propaganda we know that you can put an element of propaganda but we should be able that for example let me give you one example the case of kwakwa yes um you have to report that when people go there, they should know at least that. When I say there are th three women who got burned, I went to Kumba, I went around there. Not everybody has a means to, but you can have people around who give you information, but it should be that whatever you say, when they double check it, it should be correct. That's true. When, and because the lying, when you lie, it creates problem, first of all, to the, uh, the, the people, the, the, the community, because once you say sometimes that okay 100 soldiers have been killed <laughs> for christ's sake you are inviting hell on them <laughs> sometimes only one or two soldiers yes. and what the government does now is that they have a scorch earth politics when they read it like that they go there and kill people so what but explain to our people what you mean by an earth, uh, earth scorch policy what does that mean tell the, our audience what that means uh, well, they, 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 it simply means that they are burning houses. That's scotch earth. You like Alexander the Great. You just come and burn it, as they did in Kwakwa or Bole or Bakundu, Boa Bakundu or Fo Bakundu. What is happening? Or what they did at Tadu, where when I said it, there were people who insulted me and said I was lying. Yeah. Until a friend of TV Sink went there and reported and showed the whole world that. Look at how soldiers are breaking into houses at Tadu. And it has been going on like that for long. I could remember when I was still at Canal 2, there were a group of gendarmes who went to one village around Kumbo under the guise that they were going to arrest someone who was growing cannabis. But when they went there, they decided to steal, and one man decided to defend himself. But people never wanted to report about it. So I think the first thing is that we should, re we should try as much as we can that our news should be accurate. Okay. If it is accurate, I know we are human beings. We can make mistakes. All right. But have I, the humility I to have, say, have, I'm I have, wrong. I have this question. Yes, sir. The interim government of the people of Southern Cameroon is gearing up. Has the policy of self-defense, how has that, has that forced mm -hmm. the BR government to rethink its strategy? Of course, uh, as an individual, as I'm speaking, yes. I will never advocate for violence, mm. whatever. Mm. For sure, you're a journalist. Because, yes, because I know violence begets violence. But the attitude or the strategy of self-defense has made the government to rethink. Because I have discovered now that those boys are becoming more professional. Okay. We got... At first, they used to have these hit and run tactics, but I've discovered in some theaters that they almost have conventional warfare tactics, which is quite worrying to the government because if these people start facing the government forces as they are doing, it means that this fight or these, uh, yes, the current crisis might last for long and it might cross over the Mongol. So I think that's what the government is thinking about that. So as, so as they are thinking about this, mm -hmm. is this the thinking about it that make them to reshuffle the cabinet? Oh, well, perhaps. But they did a mistake by bringing people who are unpopular. But then mm -hmm. I don't want to run into conclusions that... That's fine. You have, yeah, you have somebody like Atanganji. You know, people do change. Look at the case of Zimbabwe. Who would have known that Manangwa could overthrow Mugabe and promise that he's going to do reforms? Perhaps Atanganji may surprise many people okay. by trying to atone his sins. Uh, but I don't think that changes or reshufflement was enough. I think the government is going to negotiate after October, at the end of October, after Paul Bia organizes his elections, and wins. Before, Maybe that was yeah, when. Before, before we get there, what is their calculation? Their, ca their current strategy and calculation right now. Why did B Mr. Bia rush to organize the Senate elections? 
Well, I think he, 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 now I'm just speculating. My thought is that what he wants to do, organize a Senate election, perhaps the head of the Senate is going to be an Anglophone. You have the Minister of Interior, an Anglophone. And after the presidential election, when he wins eventually, when negotiation begins, if you want to dangle the claims that well, uh, they have never respected mm -hmm. the constitution of this country, he will tell you that, or they will tell you, look, the number two man of this regime is an Anglophone. The Minister of Interior, who is technically the number three person in the government, is an Anglophone. What will you do? So my take is that he has done that in a strategic manner to try to make people feel that uh, he wants to solve it. Let's wait and see. If he appoints the head of the Senate as an Anglophone, it will mean that he is going along the line of my thinking. Because my thought are that what he wants to do is that he don't want to negotiate on a weak background. Because they will tell you, all right, you are just about six months, eight months. You don't have the legitimacy that this is required. When he wins, I think he will come now and negotiate. Because I think he's a human being. He doesn't want to have the legacy of Mobutu Seseko or Siad Barry. I think he wants to leave the country as he inherited it, even though he has destroyed it economically, socially, and morally. Okay. And so, what's the role of Atangaji now? What's, what's the role of Atangaji as the Minister of uh, Territorial Administration? What is he being elected to do regard to this crisis and also in regards to the traditional rulers in the Northwest and the Southwest? Well, I think Bia is a very willy politician. He has been there for too long. Those who want to underestimate him are doing that at their own risk and peril. I think he has appointed him, one, he, hasn't, he doesn't have the formal education that everybody thinks. So, so basically he thinks streetwise. <laughs> yeah, there is a, yeah, he's a streetwise guy. And then he's a creation of Paul Bia. He's a fanatic. I think what he wants, Bia wants to do first People have been accusing people from Enam, the well-educated people. So you have someone that people have been laughing at him. He has appointed him to command them. And secondly, he wants someone who will fight for him tooth and nail. Because Bia knows that the international community are watching on him. The international community are waiting for the least mistake that is going to happen for them to disown him. To, dis so to, to, dis to disown who, Bia? To disown Bia, yes. Because this election are going to, well, unravel a number of things. If there is any challenge to his victory with proofs, I think he's not going to get international support. That's what I think. But I also think that... So, so is, that that, why, is, that why he, is that why he elected Atangan Paul as the Minister of Territorial Administration in order to make yeah. it, in, in order to prepare the groundwork so that no matter what happens, it should never get out. Sure, because Atanganji owes his existence to one man, and it is Paul Bia. He's loyal to Paul Bia. We, cannot, we might not like him, but it is not a crime for someone to be loyal. Okay. But from my experience is that if you are loyal to a dictator, but the dictator is never loyal to you. So he might be used to do violent acts to intimidate people and make sure that Paul Bia gets elected. But if he is, I don't think he was appointed to solve the Anglophone crisis because Paul Bia knows Atanganji can't solve the Anglophone crisis. He was appointed to make sure that he, get, he gets re-elected. He wants somebody with firm hands, as uh, Stalin had one man called uh, uh, Nikita uh, Yeov who used to kill people during Stalin's regime. So I think he was just there for, he has been appointed to make sure Paul Bia wins. Okay, so we so you because at the, at the beginning you said Bia was willing to compromise and accept the two state federation. Yes, sir. After Australia, yes. after by the end of October, when all let now the Senate election is done, we're just waiting for the results. The uh, the, the the municipal, the parliamentary, and the president election. When all these elections have taken place, Bia, let's say we know based on the, 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 the electoral map now, Bia wins. What, what will Mr. Bia want to offer after he consolidates a victory 
in terms of his calculation. Well, well, now you know that we are just speculating on him, trying to say what he's going to offer. I think he is aware now that the Anglophone position has been radicalized. Okay. He, he will certainly have something to offer, and the Anglophones will also have something to offer. What will they offer? Both, I don't know. But okay. in any negotiation, you need two to tango. And in any negotiation, there's bound to be, there, there are bound to be some compromises. So uh, uh, I don't know what it's going to offer. The interim government, but, the Southern Cameroons, yes. they've declared independence, the restoration of independence on the 1st of October. Siseko Julius Tabayok informed the international community, told them this is what we are going to do. They told them. We re I remember two days before the 1st of October, there were some UN monitors on the ground. We don't know what they were doing, but we saw UN vehicles. We saw images. We don't know what they were doing. Elections, the restoration of independence was declared. <laughs> will the people of Southern Cameroons, from what you've seen on the ground, will they hold on firm to this restoration of independence? Or if Bia pushes them too long, for far too long, the suffering becomes too much, they will give up? Uh, no. People are not going to give up. Because uh, from what I've been saw when I went to the camps in Nigeria, people are not going to give up. Okay. But, but I know people, people are going to be angry about this. Uh, the restoration was done, but that was simply a propaganda stone. Nobody recognized one, uh, us. Yet. The other country. Yet. Yet. Yes. I'll give you an example. The, people, the case of Western Sahara is a kind of similar to ours. But there are people who recognize Western Sahara. There is another place, case, Somaliland. It's not yet internationally recognized. But there are some countries like Ethiopia, Djibouti, that tend to uh, uh, give them a year, so a, a what, listening so ear. So what is the option of the interim government? Because the interim government has moved over the last year or so, focused exclusively because we as people of Southern Cameroon's background, they believe that because the cause is so genuine. They believe that because the history, the historical fact is on their side. They believe that the law is on their side. They believe everything was on their side. And they thought if they go the civilized way, not the crooked way, if they go the civilized way, advocacy, internationalization, sensationalization, and strategic diplomacy, they will secure vic victory. That is taking too long. Now you have actors on the ground. People are taking up self-defense to defend themselves against the, this brutal regime. The interim government has now changed its position. The interim government has made self-defense an official policy. Where do you think this is going? It's going nowhere. What is going to happen is, I'm sorry to say, what is going to happen is simple. What the interim government has to do is to look for a, a ways and means to negotiate. Independence is a gradual process. We can get to Boya, not necessarily because there's this oh, okay. in the just, world. Just stay there I... with me. Just stay there with me. I will get to that point. You said the interim government needs to negotiate. Are yes. you say, well, I'm just asking you about now that we have self-defense actors on the ground and it's creating headache for the BS government and it's creating them to rethink their strategy. If the self-defense effort, it's quadrupled, it's doubled, it ten, ten, becomes tenfold, with more of what you have said on the ground in all 13 count, counties, what will happen? Um, we, we have to say things which are realistic and not be idealistic. One, the international the current geopolitics mm -hmm. of the world yes. and of the region in particular is not favorable for a new state. But there is a but. What are they favorable, what what are, what are they favorable to? What is favorable, honestly, is 
the historic pact of what we have is a return to two state federation. And, and now when you go back to, to yes. And what I wanted to ask you, because this I've talked to a lot of experts on this subject that I do I do interview them. They come into that same conclusion. Since the interim government has declared restoration of independence, since the interim government is now on a new path endorsing self-defense while they embark on international diplomacy. Will the interim government, if Mr. Bia offers Mr. Sacco that I want to negotiate or offers Mr. Yaba, I want to negotiate, will Mr. Sacco, from your understanding of these people, Will Mr. Sacco, after promising the people of Southern Cameroon independence, will Mr. Sacco be okay to compromise for a two-state federation in order to secure peace? Yes, sir. If he's an intelligent person, he will. Because, you know, in life, we learn from others. We are not the only people that we have history on our side, and then we are unjustly treated. I have talked, I gave you an example of the Kurds. The Kurds have been thrown in four countries, Iran, Iraq, Turkey, Syria. So I think we should be honest with each other. We should not lie. To, I will not be party to it. Yeah, I'm not a merchant so, of, That's why we yeah. want to be a very objective. <laughs> Good. I'm not a merchant of illusion. I know Boya is possible. Boya is possible, that is, there is the return to a federal system whereby we are going to have a local assembly in Boya. That is what is possible. Would, and the other thing... The, let, 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 before uh, the, you and one us to tell us that, will Mr. Bia accept a two-state federation when he's pushed to the wall? He will, because now there's no option. The problem is that to salvage, he is a human being. To salvage his image, I don't think he wants to become Siad Barre, second Siad Barre, or Mobutu Sese Seko, uh, or Mr. Nimeri. What he can do now to salvage his image is to sit and talk. Well, you say Paul Bia will offer to talk, right? Sese Seko, um, uh, 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 Sako. Sako. Sako can also offer to negotiate. We want to talk. That's even a public relations tone. We want to talk and let's listen to how they are going, if they are disposed to discuss. So I think that, sincerely speaking, and the other thing, I let, let me point it out very fast. Please. So, Self-defense might be good, but the reality is that it is going to create a lot of problems. We already have the Niger Delta people, the movement for the actualization of, of Biafra. We have Boko Haram. And no international body will accept to have another theater of people who are killing people around. But but wouldn't that but would, isn't that isn't that what Mr. Bia is responding to now? Because when they were protesting peacefully, he wasn't moving. Now that there's a little bit, it seems as if it seems as if that's 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 kind of a leverage in which he tends to want to avoid by all costs. Yes, that is it. But what we have to do is that that is what he's doing. But I think. While the West Cameroonian and the Southern Cameroonian have every justification of everything, their history is on their part, but what they have to understand is that it should be step by step. We should learn from others. Uh, the Scottish National Party, the Catalans, the Corsicans, you are in Canada, the Bloc Quebecois, how, what did they do? We can learn from them and then we go forward. The, 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 the last, I know that we've taken so much of your time and we've also taken a lot of the, the, the viewers' time. But this is so important. Who will be held responsible for the atrocities that have been done? The person who will be held responsible is Paul Bia because he is the head of state and he has been unable to call his boys and girls to, to, to order. He is will, responsible. Will there ever be a time that the United sure. Nations, would that ever be a time that the United Nations will, at some point, really do a thorough investigation and dig down that at least more than 500 people have been killed? At least 
four or five villages have been burned down, would they really, would, would at some point a sense of humanity come upon all of us? Will the government of Canada, the government of Australia, something in the, within the, the, uh, the Trump administration or something within the UN at some point or even the AAU, the AU, would there be a some point in which they said no? We want to go in there and find out what's happening. Mr. Biel, you cannot stop us from sending the UN investigators down on the ground. We need the facts. Can they, would they do that? Yes, already investigations are going on. Even at the International Criminal Court of Justice, there are investigations going on because uh, the world cannot just close its eyes like that. Uh, but as far as some people in the international community are concerned, they think it is still a low intensity problem or warfare, which I dispute with them every time because I say this thing is going to go on and on and it's going to take another dimension. You know, we have already about 20 or 25,000 refugees in Nigeria. Right now, if, according, to the, according to the official record, they are 40. And according to on the official estimate, right now they said it's about 100,000 people. Great. You know, when the number of refugees start increasing, then Nigeria is bound to do something. Yeah. And even in Nigeria, contrary to the posture that Buhari is giving, there are many people in Nigeria who are worried that allowing a, a, a large influx of Cameroonians into their territory might end up also destabilizing them and so something has to be done. So but I, don't count on the African Union. So I know that as we speak, there are people of Mr. Bia government watching. We know yes. that people of the interim government are watching. We know that uh, good-hearted, loving people of Canada are watching. And some people in the United States are watching. Is there anyone who will be tried for this genocide, for these atrocities, for burning down the whole village and burning down grandmothers alive? Sure. People will be tried, especially uh, the head of the military that the names are known. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, there's one gentleman who went and commanded, what is that, at ACOC. When a person like that betrays himself, he is boisterous. He goes on Facebook, talks about what he has done in ACOC. He doesn't know that. He is selling himself. People like that will be tried or prosecuted. prosecuted. So, because I, even I, so, so as we speak, the person who gives the order and the person who carries the orders both are guilty. If, when... When, when, when the international community start coming on them. Sure. People, they are guilty because you are not duty bound to execute the order that I give to you. We are human beings. If you go in a village like Kembo and burn it down, burn Kwa Kwa, burn a whole sub division like Mbonge or Diake uh, Bafo, what do you expect? All those people will be punished at so, some point. So now that you remember, uh, I think on, on December 7th, the uh, SDO of Formanu, I think Om Joseph Day, <laughs> two, the second, yes. issued out a communique asking people from 16 villages to evacuate with immediate effect. And as we speak, most of those villages there is no human being there. A primary example is Kajifo, Bodam, Dadi, Kajifo, a village of about 4,000 people. Not a single soul. Are these crimes against humanity? Of course, yeah, they are. They are crimes against humanity. Look, to characterize a crime against humanity is when you focus on a particular group of people, and you do what has been happening. It is crime against humanity. Uh, you cannot. So, Mr. Mr. Om Joseph the second, and all those that are working in the BS administration, know that the world is also watching. Sure, um, including those also who come on Facebook 
and recommend the killing of people. We should be very careful. It is true that uh, the BI administration is responsible for what is going on, mm -hmm. but uh, people who go around also calling for the massacre of people is not good. So we should be very careful with, the, with our utterances. What, uh, what, last, uh, last word, what would be your advice for Dr. Sacco, the new acting interim president, in for two, two ways, uh, to the people of Southern Cameroons on ground zero and to the people of Southern Cameroons in the diaspora, and what should he do on the international, uh, on the international level? Uh, my, my advice first is for him to look for negotiations. Mm. People are suffering on the ground. And then the second thing is that he should be like the PRO of what is going around. He should be able to inform the world on what is happening. As far as the uh, diaspora is concerned, they should continue helping their kids and kin on the ground because people are suffering. The economy has been destroyed. The infrastructures are going up, so they should continue helping, helping, helping. If you have a brother, a sister, a mother, a wife, a son, keep sending him even ten pounds, ten dollars is going to be helpful. Mm. And what and what and what should the kind people of the world do to their uh, do to help Southern Cameroons? Uh, they should try to mount pressure on the government of Cameroon to try to exercise refrain, uh, uh, so because restrain, restrain in the uh, excessive use of power on vulnerable people. You cannot use gunners, tanks, to attack people who have only den guns. Mm. Or, who have, or who have no weapons, because... <laughs> or no weapons, yeah. All right, so Mr. Smith, it's uh, been a great pleasure and an honor to uh, have you share your wisdom, your experience, uh, your, your views with us. Uh, we're very grateful. Thank you very much, sir. It was a pleasure having me, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so let me continue with the viewers. To our viewers, you've heard it all from the man himself, our extraordinary journalist, um, Ellie Smith. And so I... Uh, I'm very grateful you've heard it from the man himself and that's why we need to continue to have this public debate with people with the expertise, with people with the insight, with people that are on the ground. This is very important. And so having conversations like this help us to educate ourselves, help us to know what's happening and how can we chat our way out of this in the way that it serves a greater purpose for everyone, especially for the people of Southern Cameroon that have been marginalized, subjugated for the last 56 years. It's about time um, to give them the, uh, the proper foundation to a better state that they deserve, whether determined by our leaders, a two-state federation, or a full, uh, in the, a full independent state. We'll leave that for our leaders to take up the responsibility to chart the course for our destiny. But in any ways, I am very grateful for your interaction. I'm very grateful. I hope this has been very beneficial for, for all of you, for everyone. If you have a comment, I'll, I'll, I'll be able to take some questions. You have a comment, please. Um, I'm here, let's spend the, the next five minutes or so and take questions. If you have no more questions, then uh, I'm very uh, grateful for your time. All right? <laughs> Any questions, guys? Any question? You guys have any question for me? Mr. Collins, hello, big bro. Grace, a jelly. Dion, <laughs> big boy. Ah, uh, Magnus, 
Hello, the diva. All right, guys. Uh, thank you for your time. Happy Easter to everyone, and I appreciate you all for uh, the time we've spent together. So let me also uh, let me also go start my day. So I hope this has been great. I hope it's been educative. I hope it's been inspiring. Take the message and share it out to the world. So we'll talk to you guys soon. See you soon, guys. Have a great Easter.